I still remember how sad I felt when Nixon died. Now, you probably think that I'm a staunch Republican, but the Nixon I mourned as a child was not the President of the United States, but my pet chicken. <laughs> as my pet, Nixon was the only chicken on my grandmother's farm in Hungary allowed to die a natural death. <laughs> I named my chicken Nixon to spite my cousin, who named her Duck Johnson. <laughs> you see, in my grandmother's tiny village, all American presidents were popular. For us in socialist Hungary, they represented the free world. I'm telling you this story to make you understand my passion for freedom. Not only political freedom, but freedom of all sorts. I'm a professor of music, and I teach music theory and topics related to the history of Western classical music. I never felt the need to tell my students about my country of origin. But the world has changed. And as more and more people in more and more countries vote for authoritarian leaders who promise secure lives in exchange for freedom, I decided that it was time to share with my students my experience of growing up in a country without political freedom. So I designed a course about music's role in totalitarian systems. For a music professor, this is an unpleasant topic to teach. Why? Because at the end, music comes off really poorly. Instead of heroically resisting the totalitarian state, in most cases I taught, music became a tool of state propaganda. Of course, it is unrealistic to expect composers to perform heroic deeds under political terror. And it is irrational to expect some sort of positive message in the context of death camps and Stalinist oppression. But it is human to want something positive, even in the darkest stories. So I'll give it a try today, not only to console lovers of music, but also to give hope to people who feel lost in a world that's changing too quickly and not always in the right direction. My positive message is my belief that music can do something after all. It can teach us compassion. And compassion can help us to resist political systems and political movements that aim to take away our freedom. Let me return for a second to Hungary, the country that used to be the happiest barrack in the Soviet system. And indeed, even in its darkest day, Hungary never matched Stalinist Russia. Nobody was arrested in my family. None of my family members were openly persecuted, and we had enough to eat. Yet in my gut, I do carry remnants of fear. Not fear of death, but fear of losing my moral values in a system that required constant lying and constant compromise. I did see people's moral core collapse in their everyday petty struggle with a fundamentally corrupt, repressive state. Totalitarianism is a hard word, hard to pronounce and hard to define. The simplest way to define it is probably to say that totalitarianism is the opposite of freedom. The dictionary says that Totalitarianism is a system of government that is centralized and dictatorial and requires complete subservience to the state. Complete subservience means that the state has total control over each individual 
in every sphere of life. Total, in this context, is a frightening word that allows no exception, no escape. In other words, no liberty. And that is why totalitarian governments are not simply extreme versions of dictatorships. They are radically new forms of governments that disregard all previous political practices. Their unprecedented nature assures their success. They are no tried and true. They are no tried and true defenses against them. Why would people voluntarily give up their freedom and submit completely to a repressive state? We need to answer this question if we want to understand the rapidly changing political landscape around us. We need to recognize parallels between our vulnerabilities and the historical circumstances that led to the establishment of totalitarian systems. Let me point out some of these parallels. The weakening of established political uh, the weakening of established democratic institutions then and now. The disillusionment of the masses then and the disillusionment of people today flocking to populist political leaders, and the proclivity of populist politicians and dictators then and now to create chaos and instability, spread lies, and feed on illusions until people can't tell the difference between truth and lie. So I ask the question again, what attracts people to such leaders? First of all, the convenient and simple explanations they provide. Such explanations frequently include pointing at a fictitious enemy as the cause of all the problems. For the Nazis, it was the Jews. For Stalin, it was the bourgeois class. It can be ethnic groups, people with a different religion, with a different political orientation. Populist leaders dehumanize and demonize these groups and channel their voters' frustration and hatred against them. How do they dehumanize and demonize the enemy? They explain that the hated people are not like us, that they belong to a completely different species and hence, they don't deserve our compassion. It is this lack of compassion that allows totalitarian governments to eliminate undesirable elements from the society. The Nazis invented extermination camps and industrial mass killing to eliminate human beings whom they declared superfluous or harmful. You can call these places of elimination concentration camps, labor camps, detention camps, or prisons. The point is that totalitarian societies need such places of elimination. In a healthy community, such a process of elimination is not possible. The community's immune system, governed by compassion, would kick in and would prevent the removal of members of the community. And that is why in totalitarian countries, compassion is systematically repressed. When the police officers, were, when the police officers noticed that my grandmother was crying, when the Jews were marched out of her village in 1944, they told her that if she felt so compassionate, she should join them. Clearly by showing compassion, my grandmother became complicit in the fictitious crimes Jews supposedly committed. By now you might be wondering what music has to do with all of this. Most people think of music as a refuge from the world, something relaxing, something 
beautiful that protects us from ugliness. Talking about music and politics in the same sentence seems to damage music's ability to comfort and provide refuge. But music does not exist in a vacuum. It interacts with the society in which it's created, even when it tries to resist it. I have told you that, to my regret, music did not come off as the hero of my story about totalitarianism. But maybe we are asking music to perform something it cannot. Maybe we should ask music to do something it can. Teach us compassion, so we will not abandon our natural sense of empathy. Our political affiliation should not determine whether we think that separating children from their parents is acceptable. That should be a question decided by compassion, by our ability to imagine ourselves in other people's shoes. I have told you that I believe that the opposite of freedom is totalitarianism. But the opposite of total control is not total freedom. Our personal freedom is limited by the respect we should have for other people's freedom. We can sense the limits of our freedom by exercising compassion, the very feeling totalitarian governments try to eradicate. The good news is that compassion is a universal human feeling. It can connect people independent of their country of origin, political beliefs, religion, or any other differences that otherwise set them apart. In our rapidly changing world, compassion remains a constant, at least as a possibility. But although it's universal, compassion still needs practice. Music is the safest place. We can practice all sorts of emotions, Sadness, grief, rage, love, happiness, and yes, compassion. Even people who insist that opera is an elitist art form that has nothing to do with them cry their hearts out at Puccini's La Boheme. They cry because the music moves them. Through music's ability to move us, we expand our emotional vocabulary which helps us to relate to other people's emotions. By recognizing and sharing other people's passion, we exercise compassion. I encourage you to safeguard your freedom by using music as a training ground for compassion. Don't expect music and musicians to resist totalitarian oppression, but do allow music to do what it can do best. Connect us to our emotions and connect human beings through shared emotional experience. At the height of Stalinist terror, the slow movement of Shostakovich's Fifth Symphony moved people to tears because it allowed them to emotionally engage with their own suffering. As required, Shostakovich erased the gloom by a triumphant finale. The expression of suffering was permitted under Soviet rule only as long as it was overcome by mandatory optimism. Yet despite the neutralizing effect of Soviet bombast, the tear stains remained. And the compassion they evoked reminded Soviet citizens of their true human qualities. We need more of these tear stains. We need more of these reminders. We need music that works on us in ways that are powerful and ensure that our compassion remains a safeguard of our freedom. <laughs>